please pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you for the infinity of stars that you have used to create this universe, those lesser lights that rule the night. And we thank you for the infinity of your children who show forth your glory. Amen. So to recap, we're in the middle now of a six-week series of sermons on the Beatitudes, those sayings of Jesus that are found in the fifth chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew. Uh, remember that Jesus is addressing a mixed crowd of Jews and Samaritans and Greeks, a mixed crowd of believers and non-believers, those who think they belong and those who have been told that they don't. And Jesus says that we are blessed, that is to say we're happy or fortunate when we're poor in spirit or when we are meek or when we mourn. Jesus is announcing the coming of God's kingdom where things are as God intends them to be, even if that feels a little topsy-turvy from what we expect. And today we're on the fourth beatitude. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. So what is righteousness? Righteousness is when things are as God intends them to be. Righteousness comes from the Greek word, dikaiosune, there won't be a quiz, a Greek word meaning fairness or justice. Uh, Katrine tells me that in German, the way that it, righteousness is translated is very much like richtig, that things are correct, things are right. So righteousness is divine approval, that which is deemed right by God. Those who are righteous are those who are as they ought to be. And those who receive a righteous judgment are those who are treated justly, fairly, correctly, treated as God would have them treated. So blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, then, are those who eagerly desire to see everyone treated as God would have them treated, who earnestly desire to see everyone treated as God would treat them. Now, one other piece of recap. You'll remember that a couple weeks ago, Father Aaron told us about the rabbinical way of riffing on the scriptures, what the rabbis called a remez, a riff on the scriptures. Well, I want to just riff on one word with you today, the word thirst, because righteousness is an awfully big concept, maybe a little hard to grasp, but thirst, I think all of us can understand. Now, a remez, as the rabbis would, would suggest, is the second of the four traditional ways of interpreting a Bible text. So there's the historical way, the philosophical way, the homiletical, how do you use it in preaching, and then the mystical way. So a remez is a philosophical riff on the scriptures. So here's a philosophy, a remez, that you might recognize from watching TV. Stay thirsty, my friends. I hear knowing chuckles. Many of you can picture in your mind the most interesting man in the world. I don't always do this, but sometimes I do that. Stay thirsty, my friends. The most interesting man in the world, though, doesn't really hunger and thirst after righteousness, does he? He really thirsts for adventure and for acclaim that sets him apart from other people. In fact, if you watch way too much TV, you will remember his most recent commercial where he blasted off to Mars seeking adventure up in the heavens. Uh, he's about as far apart from us as you can get. He's more up in heaven, if you will, than down here on earth. 
Well, the flip side of that beer commercial, uh, which is appropriate, I guess, on the day before my third sobriety anniversary, uh, the flip side of that beer commercial is a much more down-to-earth story from Bill W., the man who founded Alcoholics Anonymous. Bill W. was a salesman before he lost everything due to his uh, disease. And he was in a one-room apartment in New York City, frustrated by the slow growth of this fellowship. It wasn't picking up steam the way that he had hoped it would. And he was anxious because he had thousands of copies of his big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, in a warehouse waiting to be bought, but nobody was buying them. And the story goes that on a cold and rainy night in 1940, Father Ed Dowling, a Jesuit priest, appeared at his door and wanted to talk to him about the 12 steps. And as the story goes, soon Bill was talking about the steps and taking his fifth step, uh, telling his own confession of the things he had done wrong. Uh, he told Father Ed about his anger and about his impatience his mounting dissatisfactions. Blessed are they, Father Ed said, who hunger and thirst. Bill replied, is there ne ever to be any satisfaction? And Father Ed said, never, never any. Keep on reaching. In your reaching, you will find God's goals hidden in your heart. He reminded Bill W., you've made a decision to turn your life and your will over to God. You're not to sit in judgment on how God or the world is proceeding. You have only to keep the channels open. It's not up to you to decide how fast or how slow AA develops. For whether the two of us like it or not, the world is undoubtedly proceeding as it should in God's good time. So Father Ed is essentially describing to Bill W. the pattern of the Christian life, this pattern that we call the way of the cross. And Bill begins to learn that night that he has to turn over his thirst for success and his thirst for the approval of others and turn it towards self-sacrifice instead. He's got to put down his own ambition in favor of working his own program one day at a time. We are meant to thirst. What matters is where we aim what we thirst for. Now, we Christians, we learn about this way of the cross, this way of life and peace, as our prayer book calls it. We learn about the way of the cross from Jesus himself, from the way that we see him act, at the end of his life, and especially as the end of his life and ministry draw near. Now, the Beatitudes, remember, come from the beginning of his ministry. They're early on where he's still popular and he's drawing big crowds, mixed crowds, Jews and Greeks and Samaritans too. But even before that beginning, in fact, right after his baptism, Jesus has to face a trial of temptation. He's alone in the desert and the devil appears to him and says, you know what, you look hungry. Why not make these stones into bread? And Jesus starts to realize that he's got to turn his own hunger, his concern for his own life and his ministry, his power as God's beloved, with whom God is well pleased. These things could just make him self-sufficient. He's got to turn that hunger into concern for others. He's got to aim his hunger elsewhere, as the word of God will teach him. And that's how he turns the devil away. He says, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by the word that comes from the mouth of God. So Jesus' his ministry is going to have to be about feeding others, feeding them with overflowing baskets of bread, while he eats the bread of life from God's word which, as Paul later reminds Timothy, God's word is useful for training in righteousness. There's that word again. Useful for training in righteousness so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. So Jesus has a ministry of teaching and of good works. 
But then at the end of his life, on the night before he died, he is once again all alone, this time in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's praying, Lord, let this cup pass from me. You know, perhaps in his agony, he's remembering his own parable about the need to pray always and not to lose heart. I'm thirsty, he says to the Father, but I don't want to drink from this cup. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. You know, the prayer that he taught to his disciples, the Lord's Prayer, which we pray daily, the Lord's Prayer, which people in AA meetings say together at the end of their meetings, that prayer rises to Jesus' own lips, and he says, thy will be done. Jesus must aim his eagerness for the kingdom of God away from success, away from the crowds, away even from his closest friends who are fast asleep in the garden, and toward the one final act in the drama of redemption which only he can perform. He gives up his freedom. He's arrested and he's bound and he is tortured and beaten and crucified as though he were a murderer or a thief. He endures injustice and unfairness and what is not right for the sake of the whole world. As he hangs from the cross, Jesus says with practically his last breath, I thirst. He aims what he thirsts for at the heart of the Father, and earth and heaven are joined, and man is reconciled to God. Wow. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. You know, being filled in the sense that Bill W.'s story, and much more importantly, in the sense that the example of Jesus suggests, is less about the achievement and more about the process. You know, the fellowship is growing too slowly for the Wall Street money man, but it's not about him. He must work the steps and stay humble. You know, the devil is persuasive to a young new preacher about to begin his ministry, but he's got to resist the temptation to use his power for himself alone. The cup is bitter. The cup is like sour grapes that set your teeth on edge. It's sour wine mixed with gall as Jesus hangs from the cross. But the thirsty man drinks it so that God's will for the whole world will be fulfilled. Over time, and with constant practice, as we do our best to set aside our ambitions and focus on our own way of the cross, as we try daily simply to carry out our ministries fully, we will find that our reaching and God's goals have become one. It's not up to us to decide. We're meant to thirst but what matters is where we aim our thirst. Righteousness will not come about because we aim to save the world, which Christ Jesus has already done anyway, already, by his one oblation of himself once offered, a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. Sounds familiar? We say that most every week. Righteousness will not come about because we aim to save the world, but because we aim what we thirst for, our ambitions and desires, at what we can do for others today. So stay thirsty, my friends. Amen. <laughs>